There's one rule that explains almost every major breakthrough in AI over the last 20 years. Multiplication is bad, addition is good. That sounds absurd until you realize that memory, time, precision, and stability all live or die by that rule. For years, Tesla's AI has been tactically brilliant. They have reflexes that are measured in milliseconds and Tesla cars have incredible reaction time. But as I've noted over and over in my videos, strategic thinking, in other words, 30 seconds of consistent memory has been much harder. But here's the thing, that's not really an intelligence problem, it's more of a memory problem, which for neural networks is a math problem. Well, guess what? It turns out that Tesla's brilliant engineers just patented a way to turn long-term memory from a multiplication problem into an addition problem, and that, my friends, changes the very nature of time and memory. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. I have to give big props to Ming or Tesla Ming here for breaking this story. I'm not gonna read this entire post because as you'll see, it's very, very long. But what I wanted to try to do was explain to you as a general sort of tech savvy audience that's not a bunch of deep neural network nerds how this actually works and why it's so important. I will read the title, however. Breaking, Tesla has patented a mathematical cheat code that forces cheap 8-bit chips to run elite 32-bit AI models and rewrites the rules of silicon. And I'll also read this first paragraph because it explains why it's so important. How does a Tesla vehicle remember a stop sign it hasn't seen for 30 seconds or a humanoid robot maintain perfect balance while carrying a heavy shifting box? It comes down to rotary positional encoding or ropes. And ropes are already a move from multiplication to addition, but they don't fully convert from multiplication to addition. So first of all, let's discuss why multiplication is such a bad deal for artificial intelligence, especially for AI that's trying to quote remember things in other words having a sense of continuity between the past and the present so why is time or in other words cycles of calculation so brutal to multiplication we can explain that relatively quickly by realizing what happens when you multiply very small or very big numbers together over and over again so we can pretty easily show this with a demonstration. We're gonna take two numbers, which aren't that big a deal, 0 0.01 times 0 0.01. We're gonna multiply them together and you can see we get 0 0.0001. So in other words, we've added a couple of zeros to that. Let's continue this process. So we'll do another times 0 0.01 and now we've got that small number, times another 0 0.01 and now we've got that small number. You can see it's getting small real fast times it again, and now we've gone one e to the negative 10, so in other words, we've got 10 zeros there plus a one. Let's do it again, and on and on. And now you can see we have one e to the negative 14th, or in other words, 14 zeros followed by a one. And that's just a few levels of multiplication with relatively large numbers. 0 0.01 is not that small. Compared to a lot of numbers that neural networks have to deal with, it can easily be orders of magnitude smaller than that. You start multiplying these numbers together, even two or three or four or five times, and you get very small numbers. Well, what if you have to do it a thousand times? If you have something running at 30 frames per second and you have to remember 30 seconds of that, that's 30 times 30 or 900 times. If you multiply even a relatively large number like 0 0.01 times itself 900 times, you're going to get what's called a vanishing gradient. That number is basically going to go to zero no matter what your computer's resolution is, and that is a big problem. And this is exactly why multiplication is the bane of neural networks remembering things, because that multiplication causes either very small numbers or very large numbers to eventually vanish or explode to near infinity, and you just can't deal with that in a computer. And so you might be like, well, I'll just throw more and more precision at it, right? If we have 32-bit numbers, we can go to 64-bit numbers. If we have 64-bit numbers, we can go to 128-bit numbers or 256-bit numbers, and we can keep that vanishing or exploding gradient in check for longer. But that means that you have to have these huge, huge numbers, and you have to have the memory to store those huge numbers, and you have to have the bandwidth to push those huge numbers through the stack. In other words, through whatever kind of computation you have to do out to the other end. And while that might be possible in a giant data center that has thousands of really, really high-end GPUs and stuff, that's not going to work in a portable computer like you find on a vehicle or in a humanoid robot. So what are you going to do about that? Well, it's that time of year again. Resolutions, fresh starts, all that good stuff. But here's the truth. While most people are planning to improve this year, the smartest people are already mastering the one skill that matters most in 2026, AI. Looking at where things are headed, 2026 is going to be a peak moment for artificial intelligence, which means this is your last real window to get in on the AI ship before it sails. So instead of letting another year slip by, why not get ahead of the AI game in just two days? That's where today's sponsor, Outskill, 
comes in. They're the first AI-focused educational platform designed to accelerate real-world AI learning for people like you and me. And this weekend, they're hosting their two-day AI mastermind training live this Saturday and Sunday from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Time on both days. And better yet, as part of their New Year Upskilling Fest, you can join absolutely free instead of the usual fee. This is a 16-hour live training that's already helped build over 10 million AI-first professionals worldwide, and it's rated 4.9 out of 5 on Trustpilot. Folks from marketing, finance, operations, product, and engineering all join. Because AI isn't tied to one industry anymore, it's becoming essential in every industry. Here's what you'll learn how to do. Build AI agents that plan, write, execute, and report for you. Automate workflows that keep working even while you sleep. Connect tools like Sheets, Notion, CRMs, and email into profitable systems. And use AI to save hours every week and gain a real advantage at work. And it's not just about skills, it's about monetization. People who've taken this training have launched AI-powered services, earning them $2,000 to $3,000 per week simply by applying the systems they're taught. If you attend both days, you'll also get lifetime premium bonuses, including the AI Prompt Bible, the AI Profit Roadmap, your personalized AI Toolkit Builder, and my favorite part, you'll also receive the 2026 AI Survival Hackbook, which breaks down upcoming AI shifts and the practical steps that you can take to stay ahead. Seats are limited, so grab your free spot using the link in the description and pinned comment and join the WhatsApp community so you don't miss any updates before the event. Thanks again to Outskill, and now let's get back to it. Well, here's the trick that sounds easy until you realize it's really difficult to do. You trade that multiplication for addition. And interestingly enough, in the past, in large language models that originally used recurrent neural networks and long short-term memory, or RNNs and LSTMs, RNNs in particular used multiplication very, very heavily and suffered extremely from vanishing and exploding gradients. LSTMs, on the other hand, were able to mitigate that to some extent and reduce the amount of multiplication, which made them better than RNNs, but you still had multiplication in there. And so as the context window would expand, in other words, as how many words or tokens it had to remember expanded, both of these techniques, because they used multiplication, failed relatively quickly. Along came transformers, and one of the big innovations of transformers was that they converted pretty much all of the multiplication over long term into addition. And that tamed that multiplication beast and turned it into an addition beast, which is why transformers can have such large context windows compared to RNNs and LSTMs. Now, are they perfect at this? point, no, they still have some multiplicative stuff that goes on in them. And eventually, you know, at 100,000 tokens or something, they will eventually lose track, but they're able to scale to much larger context windows before they start to fail. So the overall secret here and the thing that Tesla's patent taps into is you're moving from multiplication to summation, which moves us from instability, in other words, vanishing or exploding gradients to controllable drift. In other words, while errors will still accrue, they're much more controllable. Additionally, they just add up linearly instead of exploding exponentially. So this takes us to rope or rotary positional encoding. And this was originally developed for transformers, but as it turns out, it's a key element of Tesla's patent as well. So rope is not actually spinning a real wheel, but you could imagine it like that. It's like a vector. So you could imagine this pen as a vector. You've got something that has a magnitude and a direction. And what you can do is you can rotate that direction and that's the rotational positional encoding. And so what happens here is that you can go from multiplying two things to adding them because you can add these vectors together to get their rotational encoding. And so here you could imagine we have token one, we start at zero degrees, we go to step two, we add a, another token, we add 90 degrees, step three adds another 90 degrees for 180, step four adds another 90 degrees. Now it could be any arbitrary amount. This just so happens to be 90 degrees per rotation, but it could be any arbitrary amount. And so we've taken a multiplication problem and turned it into an addition problem with rope. Now the interesting part here is that this is modulo 360. In other words, when it gets back from zero to 360 degrees, the rotation of this vector is the same as it was, which seems like it will cause loss of precision because once it rotates 360 degrees, you're back where you started and you don't know anymore if you've gone around once or twice or a hundred times or whatever. And this is where the reality of things differs a lot from this simple diagram. If you think about a high dimensional space, in other words, a vector with maybe a hundred dimensions or something like that, and this particular vector is pointing in a certain 
direction in that high dimensional space, well, you can have a whole bunch of other vectors that are pointing other directions in that high dimensional space. And if you rotate them at different frequencies, in other words, they rotate around this circle, each of them rotates at a different frequency, well, then they're never going to synchronize with each other because they're all rotating at different frequencies, which means that you never have this loss of precision. And so the rope technique actually allows you to remember things for very long term, because even if one vector in one direction actually wraps on itself, that vector in other directions and other vectors in other directions as well won't also wrap at the same frequency. And so over time, you'll still have unique rotational encodings of this vector. And so since information is distributed across many dimensions, these different frequencies prevent collapse of this vector. And the position and rotation of this vector remains uniquely encoded over long periods of time or long calculation cycles of the neural network. But unfortunately, there are still multiplications and sines and cosines involved in rope. And so even though it delays the collapse of the neural network, it can't stave it off forever because eventually those multiplications are going to take over and cause collapse. So this is where Tesla comes in with a pretty ingenious idea. And it's something that Elon Musk, when he was talking to Peter Diamandis, actually made note of in passing. When he was talking about integer math and lookup tables and things, he was actually talking about converting multiplication into log addition. And by the way, a quick aside, if you enjoy this kind of deep dive into geeky topics, please do consider subscribing to the channel. It really, really helps out the channel. I'd love to get to 100,000 subscribers, and that'd be a great birthday present for me. My birthday's coming up real soon, so consider that, and thank you very much. All right, so logarithms might cause an immediate sweat to form on your brow because you may be like, oh no, high school, I remember not understanding that at all. Basically, logarithms just count the number of decimal points you have in a number. And I'm going to use base 10 here because it's much easier for us to understand, but of course this would all be in binary, but just ignore that, it doesn't really matter. We'll do log base 10 here. So if you think of the number 0 0.00001, four zeros and a one, the logarithm of that is negative five because there's four zeros plus the one. So in other words, five decimal points before you get to the actual number. So that's negative five. If you have the number 0 0.1, that's negative one because of course there's one decimal place. If you have the number one, that's zero because you don't have to move any Anything. If you have the number 10, it's positive one because you're moving the decimal place over positive one. And if you have a thousand, the log is three because you're moving the decimal point over three spaces. So you can see how you could take a really small number like 0 0.00001 and turn it into negative five. That's much easier for a low precision computer like an eight bit computer to keep track of than a very small number like 0 0.00001. And so if you're familiar with latent spaces in terms of diffusion models and stuff, which is a space where you take all of the pixels of an original image and you compress it down into something that is much easier to deal with and that's where most of the calculations and diffusion models actually happen you can think of log space as kind of analogous to that latent space it's a space where things are much easier to deal with because these numbers even if you have very small or very large numbers effectively it's just an exponent which becomes just an integer which is very easy to deal with the log of those numbers is just a relatively small negative or positive number that you can keep keep track of. And here's the really crucial part. When you multiply two numbers together, like 0.1 times 0.1, you actually add the logarithms together. So if you take the log of 0.1, that's negative one, and you take the log of 0.1, that's negative one, you add those two numbers together, that's negative two. And then when you convert that back to a number by exponentiation, you end up with the number 0.01, which of course is the decimal point moving over two spaces to the right. Now, of course, we're hardly ever going to end up with 0.01 one or something like that, or 10 or a thousand or whatever, we're going to end up with a number like 768 or 0 0.1234 or something along those lines, right? We're not going to end up with these nice clean decimal point numbers or binary tens in the case of binary math. So the effect of logarithms is to take multiplication and turn it into addition and take these very small and very large numbers and tame them so that you don't need nearly the precision that you needed before. And so logarithmic math, you're not fighting any longer with multiplication. You tame all of that and turn any kind of errors that you build up into errors that just compound linearly as you add numbers together instead of exponentially. And suddenly you go from vanishing gradients and exploding gradient problems to the harmless problem of linear error accumulation over addition. So in the end, log space, you can think of it as like a latent space for precision. You can really reduce the amount of precision you need from 32 or 64-bit numbers down to 
8-bit numbers and potentially even down to integers if you wanted to. But things get even better than that because as it turns out, you don't need to actually perform the log math, which is actually relatively complicated and takes a long time. Instead, you just use a lookup table. And so one of the entries in the lookup table could be 0.1, which in the lookup table or LUT is negative 1. That's nice and easy. 0.01 is negative 2. And then, of course, all of the numbers in between gives you some sort of decimal numbers and stuff. Now, of course, a lot of those numbers are going to be approximates. They won't be perfect, but it doesn't ultimately matter for the results. And as it turns out, if you just have a 256 value lookup table, which says these are the 256 values that you can have, you can have a lookup table where you can look up pretty much everything you need. So we don't need to store every single possible value and we don't need to actually take logs, which does take a long time. We just store 256 representative bins and convert that number that we're taking the log of into the bin that's the closest to the actual number that we would get. And very importantly, these bins can be non-uniform. You don't have to have the same number that's less than zero as more than zero. As it turns out, small numbers are much more common in these neural networks than large numbers are. So you can reserve most of that 256-bit resolution for small negative numbers and less of that to positive or very large numbers. So as an example, you could have 200 of these 256 numbers devoted to small numbers less than one and only 56 devoted to greater than one, which means you can skew this as you need to depending on the numeric values that you're commonly getting with your neural network. So by using this lookup table, you get rid of all the math associated with taking that log and you get near instantaneous fetching like basically one compute cycle to go out and look up what in the table is closest to what you currently have. So that takes basically zero computation and minimal bandwidth and that's two huge advantages to taking the log of these numbers. So now what we're doing is combining rope or rotational positional encoding with taking the log of the numbers in these vectors using a lookup table so there's no math involved to produce a logarithmic equivalent to the numbers that we had and then we're able to convert the multiplication that we have to do using rope and other techniques into an addition problem and then at the end of course we have to convert this back to the original angles so that we can retrieve that for the output space and the way you can do this is you can use Taylor expansions but those still involve an exponent in other words multiplication but Horner's method of approximating Taylor expansion series reduces that down to very simple division which can actually be in a lookup table as well plus primarily addition as you can see here and by using Horner's method to do the Taylor expansions you're able to reconstitute the answer in the original space no longer the latent log space but you're able to reconstitute it in the original angle space which then produces the answer that you're actually looking for for the next cycle so you take a high precision angle at the beginning you reduce it down to log space you do your math in the log space which is only addition and at the very end using mostly addition still to get back the answer you go back to your high precision answer it's really ingenious and what this unlocks is the ability to move from the tactical thinking, the very, very short term, to the longer term, like 30 seconds plus, of thinking about the future. By getting rid of multiplication, you're getting rid of that problem of vanishing and exploding gradients, which means the mathematical drift is very, very bounded and linear. It means you get stable world models, you get much lower bandwidth usage and compute usage, which also means you're not hitting a thermal wall in terms of your portable compute devices. And very importantly, you also don't get bandwidth bottlenecks or collapse of trying to move 32-bit or 64-bit numbers through portable compute memory, which is very, very difficult to do. So the result of all of this is that multiplication is no longer the enemy here. You've tamed it by turning multiplication into addition using a really, really clever technique that I never would have thought of myself, but it works so well when you think about it. By turning multiplication into log addition using lookup tables and using very, very low precision numbers to do all of that work, and then at the very end, and turning it back into a high precision number using again mostly addition you get rid of the compute the memory bandwidth the power issues all of that stuff goes away and you're able to remember things for much much longer term than you would have been able to otherwise so while deep learning unlocked intelligence by compressing reality into latent space tesla has just unlocked long-term robotic memory by doing the same thing but with precision the precision of the numbers itself and that is genius already folks 
folks, that's what I've got for you today. Let me know in the comments what you think about all of this. I hope I explained this reasonably clearly. If not, please feel free to ask questions and I will try to do a follow-up video or just answer in the comments if you didn't understand something, so definitely let me know. While you're down there, if you don't mind liking the video, it really helps other people to discover the video. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. And again, thank you for an early birthday present if you do that. And finally, a big thanks once again to Outskill for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to check out the link in the description to get your free spot at this weekend's AI Mastermind training, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.